Well, I'm here with Ian C. Edwards, who is the author of a new book on E. Graham Howe. And I received it uh, fairly recently from the publisher Anathema, who are located in Quebec, Canada. So um, it is such a beautiful book and such a rarity in today's world to have such a gorgeously printed book on an obscure topic, I guess. Uh, but man, it is just beautiful. Um, I'm a, you know, I've been a bibliophile my whole life and uh, a book designer. And so I really appreciate the care and attention that's gone into this. It, uh, it's obviously a, uh, a labor of love. Absolutely. So when did your love affair with E. Graham Howe begin? Because he's someone that, uh, you know, in all my studying of psychology, I hadn't come across until very recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oftentimes when I mention that I've written a book on E. Graham Howe, people will say E. Graham who. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of the common refrain, E. Graham who. Um, so people that are well established in psychology, in particular depth psychology, um, not many people have heard of him. And for me, um, I first heard about E. Graham Howe when I was in graduate school. So while I was in graduate school, and this was back in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, graduate program in clinical psychology that focuses primarily on existential phenomenological approaches to psychotherapy, um, I was exploring different dissertation topics. And so the first idea I had was to write a psychobiography of Aleister Crowley. Um, I got about almost to the proposal stage, but I really couldn't find a full committee that would support my writing of the book. So I had to abandon that project. And I thought, okay, why don't I do something on Alan Watts? You know, I want to do something on the relationship between Alan Watts's philosophy and psychotherapy. So I was talking with my dissertation chair, who um, is uh, Dr. Daniel Burston, um, formerly of Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who has since retired. Um, I brought the idea up to him and he said, why don't you write something on Eric Graham Howe? And I'm like, Eric Graham who? Right? Mm -hmm. So I was the first <laughs> one to come up with that sort of thing. Um, and so he explained to me a little bit about who Eric Graham Howe was. And I'm like, how is it that people haven't heard of this guy? I mean, he's written 13 books, um, countless articles, um, he influenced Alan Watts. He was actually one of Alan Watts's teachers during Watts's early development, um, was a friend of Krishnamurti, um, was one of the first to integrate psychotherapy with spirituality, one of the founding members of the famous Tavistock Clinic. Um, he was an interlocutor with Carl Jung during one of Carl Jung's seminars. And I'm like, how is it that people haven't heard of him? So... I started to do a little bit of digging, and what I found out was that he was, during a time when psychoanalysis was establishing itself as a kind of dogma throughout Europe, this person, Eric Graham Howe, was this uninhibited eclectic who borrowed freely from other traditions, spiritual and philosophical, and he made liberal use of the contemplative traditions in psychotherapy, didn't write with a dogma, um, didn't want to hear, adhere to any kind of lexical canon. And then I'm like, okay, that's why he was left out of the history books. <laughs> that's why he's marginalized. That's why nobody has heard of him. Um, so I'm like, that's a great idea. And so I took my dissertation chair's guidance and um, I sought to write a dissertation on him. And so the book that you hold in your hands was originally a dissertation. Now, what you have is a much more expanded, uh, much more revised version of that. But it started off as a dissertation. And um, at the time when I wrote the dissertation, 
the emphasis was on leaving a lot of the more explicit spiritual references out. And so if you look at the original, which was called Truth as Relationship, the Psychology of E. Graham Howe, title of my dissertation, um, all of the references for the most part to Druidry, with the exception of quoting the mind of the Druid from time to time and making references here and there, that was all left out. Um, so there was a real sense that I should make this strictly about how psychotherapy and how he borrowed from these traditions to influence the psychotherapy, which is true. But there wasn't a real emphasis on me explicitly articulating his connection to Druidry. So when I revise the dissertation into a book, it's like, okay, let's include all of that stuff, right? That could have gone into the original. So it was fun to really expand it and um, to really explicitly highlight house connection with some major druidic concepts hmm. um it's it's surprising that none of his books are available in print anymore uh like you said i think he wrote about uh, 12 books and then one was released um posthumously, posthumously. the mind of a druid mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like his early books were actually quite well received in the psychology world, some of them even uh, being like required reading and uh, psychological training. Now, was there a point where he started to write more openly or did he have uh, some kind of experience that led to this break with the, uh, with the conventional psychotherapeutic world? Well, he, he studied Buddhism in India in the 1950s. And so I think that may have had an impact on him and all the while um you know again like he had from the very beginning kind of established what was this open way kind of dialogue group you know where all kinds of individuals from different walks of life would come together and convene and really talk about spiritual topics and so from the very beginning you could see like these spiritual influences on him um but if one were to argue, you know, one could say like his experiences, you know, studying Buddhism in the 1950s probably had more of a profound impact on him than you can really get explicitly from his writings that might make over reference to that. And, you know, if you read his stuff, even on Druidry, for instance, like the mind of the Druid, in many ways, it's kind of unconventional because he basically talks about Druidry and Druids being masters of the art of life, you know, with not this real emphasis on ritual or ceremonial practice, which was often a big part of Druidry. So the way I had kind of thought of how was that it was this person who really first and foremost was a healer, like he was a doctor of the soul. And he took from these various traditions, in particular Druidry, and he made that foundational to his approach to healing those that were suffering. And um, like even in, in for me, like his greatest book is uh, Cure or Heal in 1965, um, the board by um, R.D. Lang, who was also, you know, very much influenced by Howe. Um, and how was very critical of Lang too, in terms of Lang's use of psychedelics and things of that sort. Um, but Lang was very much influenced by Howe, and I think vice versa to a certain extent as well, because you see a lot of overlap. But, you know, how um, I think where he learned most was from his patients, his experiences as a psychotherapist, um, day in and day out, working with suffering souls. And so, you know, when he took from these various traditions, philosophical and spiritual, it was all, it, for me, it was a way to kind of augment and to come up with a new language for understanding, understanding the healing process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he does have a, a um, idiosyncratic use of language when he's talking about his, uh, his metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of like... Um, capitalization of words and uh uh well there's a book called the the druid of is it harley street, harley street. Mm -hmm. harley street which is where he practiced 
Uh, and it has some excerpts from some of his books that are out of print. And uh, I was kind of struck by some words would be in, in like small caps, uh, you know, he's trying to communicate something that's really hard to communicate. Um, and so he's continually talking about that T H A T small caps. Um, and so that seems to be something that he picked up from the Eastern tradition, the idea that there's a greater consciousness than, mm -hmm. um, well, I think he even said like, uh, was small C, yes. small C and the big C or something like yes. that. Yes. Yes. So yeah, absolutely. always pointing to that, that, that <laughs> with emphasis on that as the unknowable other, the, the aspect of life that's greater than any of us, um, pointing to that as the crucial element in healing and, yes. and making space for that in the therapeutic relationship. Yes. Spot on. Absolutely. Yeah. The, that kind of, and the way I sort of look at that in all caps in my relate my way of connecting how to his druidry is this idea of awen right and so awen is this kind of intermediary that translates nothingness into somethingness it's the source of inspiration it's creativity it's spontaneity it's connected to this much broader much bigger consciousness that's this pure subjectivity it's connected to that and it is that capital T-H-A-T. And so like, even though like, you know, how tries to in some way leave that untranslated in a way and not explicitly state what it is other than it's this mysterious other or the numinous or something along those lines. There are certainly cognate terms, you know, that you can compare that to, right? And so like Awen in Druidry, the Tao um, and Taoism, you know, um, Christ consciousness, you know, in Christianity, you know, Buddha nature, you know, Tathagata, you know, thing, cognate terms like that. And so there's a way in which, um, like, even in my book, I try to draw the connection between that, this mysterious other, that which is responsible for healing, and some of these other cognate kind of terms and experiences. And really, like, for someone like myself, um, who considers myself to practice in the tradition of how, to be honest, like he very much influenced my work as a psychotherapist, um, to quote kind of Alan Watts, you know, you get out of your own way in the healing process and how he even says you sort of set the ego to the side and you surrender to that, right? And it's that which is responsible for healing versus what he would call curing so in cure or heal he makes that important differentiation yeah i i pulled a, a quote from cure or heal that uh um i think sums it up very well he says uh to cure one does it through one's power over one thing and another and what is so done had best be done efficiently to heal on the other hand one straightens the limb cleans and bandages the wound, but leaves the work of healing to a mysterious and yet effective other. The healing process is to relate, meet, wed the opposites, and to hold them together in a relationship such as wrestlers endure, but without a referee. <laughs> I mean, that that's great. And it, and it resonates with some of my inspirations, like James Hillman, especially mm. the wrestling part. Like Hillman was very adamant about, you know, it's not about accepting uh, the way things are or our fate unless accepting is kind of like being in a wrestler's grip with, with, with something, you know, like uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Yes. Um, but that, that's great. W when reading some of the excerpts from Howe's work, I get a bit lost in his metaphysics. It's, it's just not my orientation to get into that stuff. So when he gets into it with his idiosyncratic language and these um, quirky diagrams, <laughs> uh, he loses me a bit. But when he speaks about the attitude of the therapist and the importance of relationship in the therapeutic uh, process, uh, that that's where I'm really intrigued. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because so referencing the dialogue that Howe had with Jung, 
in the chapter on time and the unconscious. So he makes this accusation of Jung by saying, well, look, your system is four dimensional, but you present it in this three dimensional sort of way. So Howe was very interested in kind of looking at his own system of psychotherapy, his own metaphysics, and also Jung's as these four dimensional ways of understanding healing and psychotherapy. So what I think you find in how too is that like he has these more poetic kinds of musings on that and the mysterious other and its presence in psychotherapy that you can connect to on a soulful level. But he also feels the need to create diagrams to explain it as well. Like therefore in some way, you know, like Jung with the Red Book, like his entire, the entire collected works in some way are ways of trying to make sense of his experiences that he discussed in the Red Book. So I think you could say the same thing with how, like when he encounters the presence of the mysterious other, or what I would say is Awen, like, yeah, the best way to express it is oftentimes through poetry, through inspiration, through spontaneous musings, and even through silence. But he also feels at the same time to create diagrams to try to depict it in some way. Right. And so I think he also gets caught up at times in this tendency to want to explain in some ways this mysterious principle in a manner that people can understand. Right. Using diagrams, using graphs, using, you know, things of that sort. Um, and so ultimately trying to explain that or the mysterious other using sort of a graph or a chart or a diagram is like the finger pointing to the mood. It's something that eludes it ultimately. So like many of us who have had these types of experiences um, in psychotherapy and otherwise, like how do you use language to describe something like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> T-H-A-T capitalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of what he's um, trying to describe through uh, the poetic language and the diagrams is our relationship to that um, and this like intermediary function um, of, of that between uh, therapist and patient. Uh, yeah, it, that's something that Jung, um, Jung's followers really took up, you know, creating all these diagrams of the psyche and things like that. Yeah. But uh, Jung's uh depictions of his experience were much more i would say artistic or much more like a like a yantra um less kind of explicit and uh still retaining something of the esoteric yes. um and i think like you know maybe part of jung's or how's impulse to to explain to to attempt to explain uh well, he was critical of uh, psychiatry, psychology, for not creating, um, not being um, systematic enough, for not being clear enough with their metaphysics, right? Um, and so I think he's trying to remedy that in a way. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Um, you know, especially... And you could even argue that in some way his metaphysics and his psychotherapy, his relationship to those things is a critique of psychoanalysis. It's a response to psychoanalysis in some way, right? And so you could see him very much struggling with psychoanalysis because in many ways he can be read as a psychoanalyst, which I, when I used um, Dan Burston's typology, you know, I did classify Jung, I mean, I did classify Howe as a psychodynamic theorist, but in terms of that dissident fringe group, that would include people like Jung, actually, the dissident fringe in relationship to Freud. And so you can certainly see his metaphysics in some way as a kind of remedy. Um, you know, I think in some ways, um, you know, the critique of orthodox psychoanalysis was that they were attempting to take that, if you will, and turn it into a kind of systematic dogma. And 
surrounding this idea of the unconscious, right? So there's this nomenclature, there's this relationship to Freud, sort of as the father figure, right? And I think he wanted to free psychoanalysis from itself in some way. And if you look at his metaphysics, if you look at his psychotherapy, it's almost like it's psychoanalysis stripped bare of all the dogma, of all the nomenclature, of all of the metapsychological classificatory types of terms. And so when you strip that bare, what you have is maybe the essence of psychoanalysis, which is House metaphysics and his approach to psychotherapy. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of that jargon was used to obscure um, the spiritual nature of what's been being talked about, like, especially in the case of Jung, um, you know, like the unconscious. Uh, what he's really talking about is something more like um, the Akashic records or the astral plane. Um, and so I think how is... Uh, Calling, calling bullshit on that and says, look, you're obscuring the, the spiritual reality that's in your psychology, actually. So I'm just going to be explicit about it and talk about right. it. And I, I guess that was not well received. Like it was strategic on Jung's part to obscure some of his more uh, mystical inclinations and try to keep his psychology scientific. Um, strategic in that way. And maybe that's why he was more well received he didn't scare people off as much um i don't know what's your read on that yeah and the thing with how is that he didn't want disciples you know and jung didn't either i don't believe i don't think he wanted adherents or disciples um in the sense that one would become a jungian i think jung would abhor i think he did abhor the idea that one would be a jungian in an attempt to systematize his work how was even more radical, I think, in that direction, in the sense that, you know, his metaphysical psychology, his system or anti-system, as you will, um, could not be followed, right? Um, and he even quotes Jung as kind of saying, like, well, you can't hand, you can't hand to a patient a ready-made philosophy. That's not the goal of psychotherapy, so you can't prescribe psychoanalysis for a patient there's a way in which in many ways each psychotherapy is different it's unique contingent upon the patient the client and one's relationship to the client and i think for me that's the essence of jung's psychotherapy ultimately this idea of two chemicals coming together like he talks about and then after the separation they both emerge changed in some capacity i think for how it's very similar and it involves the presence of the psychotherapist or the healer in the room as something or someone more aptly put that the patient can come in contact with and that ultimately what's responsible for the healing is this mysterious other mm -hmm. and let's not make the patient the patient but let's make in some way psyche patient right? Psyche becomes in some way the in-between of both patient and therapist. And what's responsible for healing is ultimately something that we can't pinpoint. Like we all know in psychotherapy sessions that something happens that we can't entirely explain. And then we go back to write a progress note about it. It's like you're doing some form of translation. You're translating something that happened that you can't really describe but ultimately mm -hmm. was responsible for the experience yeah. yeah can you imagine the real honest uh <laughs> transcript or the report uh to the you know whoever the supervisor the insurance agency <laughs> like we were having a discussion about this and something came over both of us and we fell into a reverie and uh, an image was all of a sudden in the space between us. And <laughs> Right. Right. Well, it, incidentally, so to, to that point, right. So um, one of the things that I do is that I oversee a counseling center at a university. And so I supervise a number of pre-doctoral trainees and one resident. And every once in a while, what I'll say to a, a, a therapist, one of my trainees, is that I want you to write. So we'll, we'll sometimes we'll say, OK, 
you know, if you read like Dostoevsky, for instance, in terms of how he describes people, right, versus like a progress note, versus a case note. Do you get more of a feel of the person from Dostoevsky or from a soap note, right? Um, you get more of a feel for a person by reading Dostoevsky. So every once in a while, I'll say, you know, and this is more for like a clinician psychotherapy now. I'll say, you know what? I want you to describe what happened experientially. I don't want you to translate this into any clinical nomenclature. You're not writing for me as your supervisor. You're not writing for an insurance company. I want you to describe what happened. And it's amazing what the clinician writes. It's poetic. It's absolutely poetic and beautiful. And you're left reading that and you're like, oh my God, I got a real feel for what happened in the room. I can't exactly describe it, but I feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, how was a phenomenologist, much mm -hmm. like Jung, uh, phenomenology was very central to Jung's approach, um, g like attempting to describe reality, really, or one's experience of reality, right? It's, that's how I think of phenomenology. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there are a lot of par parallels between how and Jung, like the, uh, the reliance on, on the third, you know, you know, however they labeled that. But the third in the room, like Jung would say, like, we're in the soup together. It's like you're you're more of a guide or a partner in the individuation or the healing process with the patient. And of course, you can't help but be changed because you're in the soup, too. Yes. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things I was struck by, you can read uh, Howe's ideas um, and get a sense of his metaphysics and all of that. But uh, for me, like the most telling thing is how other people describe a person like that. Like specifically, I'm thinking of how Alan Watts described meeting Carl Jung. Um, he, you know, he, the way he talks about him is really great. Like he had a twinkle in his eye. There was a rascality to his personality. Like he knew himself well enough uh, to know, you know, his dark side and all of that. And uh um, he said it was like he got the sense of meeting a, a fully integrated person, both the light and the dark side. And um, I went and looked up the Henry Miller collection of essays where he has an essay called uh, Wisdom of the Heart. And he talks about uh, how. Uh, and, and it's fantastic. I think um, I don't want to read it right now, but I think I'm going to read it and insert it here because it gives the same sense of a, a person who's really uh, living the, the principles that he's uh, promoting in a way. And so the thing that um, I find interesting about how, like you said, he wasn't so much interested in the kind of ritual practices of the Druids, whatever we imagine those to be. And it's largely, I think, an imagination of uh, what Druidic ritual was like. There's not a lot of Mm -hmm. documentation of that uh, but instead what he was interested in was cultivating the mind of the druid which i really like so it's not about um performing ritual uh but it's about taking on the mind of the druid now could you talk a little bit about what he conceived that to be and how it would be expressed through action and relationship yeah i mean i think that's really sort of the essence of Howe's work you know and the mind of the druid obviously being a posthumously published document you know kind of like the red book you know something that in some way came before but was published later and we can talk about what it means to come before whether it was something written or it was just something that was percolating in his own psyche. But I think if you look at all of Howe's works, what he's describing is the mind of the Druid, right? And so there's this idea that the Druid was less about the imagined ritual or ceremonial, but a way of being in the world. And so it's a very phenomenological, very existential, in my opinion, take on Druidry.
So what was it like for a druid to be in the world? And it's this idea of this magic of everyday life. It's a way of seeing. It's a way of experiencing. It's a way of connecting to the presence of Awen, you know, as the source of inspiration, right? That is responsible for all modes of creativity. It's about connecting with one's own inner bard, one's own inner muse, right? And speaking and acting and loving and connecting from that very place. So any relationship to the external other is predicated on a relationship ultimately to Awen if it's going to be authentic. And that in many ways is the mind of the Druid, right? And so when I read how especially the mind of the druid, I try to put myself in that mindset and say, okay, what's it like to look at a simple phenomenon, you know, like a stone or a tree? Because, of course, the druids were very fond of nature, right? Nature was a big part of their spirituality. And what does it really mean to have this sort of divinized approach to nature, to appreciate nature as something that was sacred? And it's because both nature and psyche have a shared reality. They have a shared connection to this mysterious other, to this mysterious source, capital S, Awen, which gives rise to all things. And in the appendix sections of my book on how I talk about Einigen the giant, right? You know, this myth um, that gets told or reconstructed and... This is my own sort of poetic musing on it. This is not a straight retelling of the story at all. It's sort of me connecting with the source of creativity and in some way allowing these words to flow through me. So the content, especially in those sections, is more about the process in terms of how I wrote it as opposed to simply what I wrote. And so from these very spontaneous, intuitive, creative places, I was able to see in some ways this mind of Einigen the giant, this great expansive mind, this mind that connects the heavens to the earth, right? The whole idea of a giant, your feet on the ground, your head in the clouds. So it's a connection, you know, that takes you from earth all the way to air and everything in between. And so it's this full connection, it's this full embrace of reality without rejecting anything. And that was a big part of how psychotherapy, it's like people in some way want to engage in what he calls protective identification, and it, not projective identification, but protective identification, where in some ways they want to avoid or shun the more shadowy, afflictive parts of the self. But the idea is, in my opinion, based on my reading, is to strip away the stories that one tells oneself or has been told about a particular experience or feeling and just allow oneself to experience it and to feel it as directly as possible because the way out is the way through. Mm -hmm. I, I love that image of the giant um, being kind of uh, the I ideal mm, person, let's say feet on the ground, head in the clouds, and a body connecting the, body. the two. Yes. Yeah, let's not forget the body. Not forget the body. <laughs> and a big uh, body at that. Yeah, a massive body capable of um, feeling so much. And, yes. uh, can, and uh, there's something about uh, his approach um, that feels very Taoist in a way. Um. And I'm wondering, like, he had this experience in the East, this encounter with uh, Buddhist thought and, and meditative experience. Now, was his, did he search out something in the Western tradition uh, to ground himself in after having these experiences? You know, I think about Jung going to the East and getting really enamored of, uh, you know, the, the chakra system and, and, um, you know, he wrote the intro to the golden flower book and all that. Mm -hmm. Like he was really enamored with the, the East, but he, uh, he refused to try to incorporate that into his psychology because he felt that, um, 
well, that we had a, a, maybe a different uh, kind of psyche or a consciousness style in the West and that we needed our own need to be rooted in our own traditions. Right. So he went to alchemy and, and Gnosticism um, to try to find uh, that kind of container for a similar type of experience and attitude. Is that what Hal was doing with Druidry? Like, did he come back and 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 seek out something like uh, what he found in the East, or is it something he came to, you know, spontaneously or by happenstance? Yeah, I th and that's a good point. Kind of comparing Hal's process with Jung's, right? And so, like, is there's this this notion that the West has to find its own yoga, right? Because Jung yeah. said that the West needs its own yoga. And so one goes towards alchemy, Gnosticism, various esoteric and occult traditions, um, contemplative Christianity, to kind of ground these experiences in the Western psyche. I'm not so sure that was the case with Howe, right? And so I don't think he would subscribe to the same belief as Jung did in reference to there being like a Western and then kind of an Eastern psyche. Yeah. Right. That's a good point. He he didn't have that same prejudice. No. Or of resistance, let's say. Yeah. Right. There wasn't that sense of resistance that you would find maybe in Jung. Um, and I think how, like we have to keep in mind too, that his father was a Christian bishop, like he was an Anglican bishop. And so from a very early age, how was steeped in Christianity, right? That was a big part of his own background. And, much, uh, much like Jung. Much like Jung as well, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, but I think how never felt the need to kind of come back and say, okay, like there are these correlative experiences and terms like in the Eastern traditions as there are with the West, but in order to attain individuation or wholeness, one must go through a more Western oriented path. I think for how it wasn't the case. Um, I think he's equally comfortable in the meditative traditions of the East as he would be with the contemplative traditions of the West. Um, and if anything, he tries to strip, and whether he was successful or not, but the spiritual experience, the meditative experience from the trappings of dogma. And so like when he even writes about meditation, and so I include in my book on how his meditation instructions, right? His meditation technique, like, you know, that's very much stripped bare of like any kind of dogmatic nomenclature. So I think what he did, whether it was Eastern or so-called Western approaches to contemplative practices, he tried to remove the nomenclature and the dogma and the system's way of approaching it and get to try to get to the essence of what was really there, whether it was East or West. And um, in a way that was kind of, you know, like I think of Husserl and Husserlian phenomenology, you know, going back, you know, to the essences, the things mm -hmm. in themselves, let's bracket all of our preconceptions about a phenomenon and let's see what the phenomenon looks like, how we experience it once it's stripped bare, or, or at least we are, made aware of what our presuppositions are about mm -hmm. yeah and that getting to the essence getting to the the quality of being mm -hmm. i think it was important for him on both sides of the therapeutic relationship that um finding that in oneself the disidentification with the the ego the small c consciousness the little me I think he uses that term at some point, the the little man or something. Yeah, there, there's there's the the inner I, the outer me, the little me. Yeah, and like I think I compared it a little bit to um, Wilhelm Reich. You know, the idea of the little man in some way. Right. So yeah, but the essence of it being to disidentify with that, and um, more and more, uh, I guess, identify with the larger consciousness. Um, that's important in, for both the, the patient looking for relief from suffering and also in the therapist who's, uh, trying to create a space in which, uh, the healing principle, Awen, um, can kind of do its thing. Mm 
yes. and uh, to allow for that. And so one of the qualities you said is essential to the therapist is uh, uh, patience, like allowing for time, mm -hmm. but also right. finding a balance of like when it's time to interject, um, maybe to push a little bit. Uh, so really uh, having a, a deep intuitive sense of right timing. Yes. And I think that's, so when I think about that whole idea of right timing, combining that with patience, you know, because even when you train psychotherapists, you know, especially those that are, you know, moving more towards um, completing all of their educational requirements, you know, you get to this place where you start talking about intuition a little bit more, you know, relying on intuition. What does that look like? How do I become more spontaneous in some ways in a session? Well, right? to trust, trust the impulse, right? That's it. Like trust where is this coming impulse. from? Is it coming from me trying to, of, you know, get rid of my own discomfort in a situation uh, or yes. yeah, that's a tough one. It is a very tough one. And even kind of like, so there's a, I think one, I think how would say that we would have to be careful even in the process where one ident disidentifies with the ego in favor of the so-called higher self or consciousness, capital C, right? Because one would have to be mindful of any tendency towards spiritual bypassing, where the move to do that is a way of avoiding in some way psychological pain, psychological um anguish you know a feeling or an emotion or an experience that one must go through and so for how like that was a huge part of his form of healing which would be not avoidance not distancing oneself from the experience but moving through it in some way and as we know from being both patients and therapists that's one of the hardest things to do, you know, to be able to sit with an experience and to feel your way through it. And I think what he would say to strip away. So when we talk about the, the egoic influence on that, it's like, okay, what are the stories that I've told myself about the experience? Or what are the stories that have been told to me about the experience? And what happens if I separate the stories and narratives from the experience itself? And then in some way you have, kind of bracketing the ego and then moving through the experience, which is transformative. I think that's where the alchemy happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, his attitude um, of like allowing time, having patience, mm -hmm. but also at being really um, intelligent about when to interject, to add something. Uh, it feels very much like Wu Wei. Mm -hmm. you know same kind of attitude like doing not doing that yes. kind of paradoxical attitude um that you just have to get a feel for and That's i think great. it's all about like wu wei is about like right timing right effort yeah well if you think too like in some way like how if one could explain how like wu wei or wei wu wei actually works right and i think you're spot on and i think i referenced this in the book that there's a way in which it is what this is about, like this spontaneous way of being, when to retreat, when, when to move forward, when to speak, when to be silent. And I think there's a way in which, like, if we believe in some way that there's a world soul or there's a logos or there's an ordering to the cosmos, I think in some way, if one connects with that in the consulting room, and that's the field, in which one is immersing oneself or the soup, as Jung had described it, there's a way in which the words will come to you. The words will come to the patient. And as you nicely said, you have to trust in those impulses, you know, and sometimes maybe those impulses are coming from a counter transference kind of place too. And so that's why good supervision and good consultation can be helpful with all of that because we just wouldn't want to romanticize every impulse that comes to one because we would have to explore that that's what again good supervision and consultations for right or or if you make a a misstep to, to just write that out or to like justify that as well i'm sorry but that's psyche speaking through me you know <laughs> right. 
right? But it's not me, it's psyche. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of another way of uh, bypassing responsibility right. for one's own actions. Um, hmm. So uh, he, I guess, had some kind of relationship with Jay Krishnamurti. Now, Krishnamurti set up a school, uh, I think, in London or outside of London. I can't remember all the details. There's a point where I did know this, but uh, he set up like an alternative school of his own, um, kind of like Krishnamurti's version of Waldorf school. Right, right. I was just thinking <laughs> of that, Steiner. Yeah. And so how did uh, Graham Howe and Krishnamurti meet? You know, I think, you know, based on my own research of that, like, so these open way groups, you know, that how had kind of started. And, um, you know, Krishnamurti was someone that how would invite to these to give talks and to give presentations. And I think their connection was formed through that, you know, how had established this very eclectic, open minded group of aspirants that were just curious about the spiritual life. And obviously at that time, uh, Krishnamurti, you know, having, you know, formally rejected his role as the world teacher and kind of going off on his own, um, separating himself from the Theosophical Society, you know, that was very appealing to how, as you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, right? another outsider. Okay. <laughs> think about it. Like, yeah. think about like the ultimate outsider, you know, yeah. here's this young man that was touted to be the messiah the world teacher and bred and raised to be such and he goes and on this day where he's supposed to ultimately accept this honor he rejects it and he disbands the order like someone like this would very much appeal to e graham how you know who truth yeah. is a pathless land like that's how right and so spiritually philosophically psychologically like how when krishnamurti for me like were very very much connected and one could only imagine the kind of dialogues that they would have like through this open way sort of discussion group right um i wish there was more to be known about those interchanges mm -hmm. you know because we don't have a lot in terms of you know, what was the impact of Krishnamurti on how? But like when you read how and then you listen to or read Krishnamurti, you're like, these are like minded individuals. That's why throughout the um, throughout the book on how I quote Krishnamurti a lot because there's so much of an influence. And even the original title, Truth as Relationship, that's right out of Krishnamurti. Right. And so for me, that was a, an ode to Krishnamurti that I was able to name the original title of the dissertation, um, Truth as Relationship, because in many ways, that is one of the threads that moves throughout Howell's writings um, and Krishnamurti's teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were including that stuff because you saw the uh, the correlations between their their thinking uh and not knowing how much he actually wrote about Krishnamurti because I can't get, I can't find his books anywhere. All I have is a, a compilation of some excerpts. Uh, so it's really hard to figure out um, some of these things, like what was his actual relationship with Krishnamurti, but also Alan Watts and with yeah. Watts. Yeah. Alan Watts in his autobiography in my own way makes mention of how, hmm. right. And that's where he talks about like, you know, meeting how basically over a meal and kind of picking his brain, you know, like how was someone who would not teach explicitly, but he was someone who obviously wasn't shy in terms of sharing his thoughts. And so, like, you can certainly see, like, when you read how and you read Alan Watts, the influence of how on Watts. But here's the thing, like, how really didn't want that kind of credit like he really wanted to in some way be obscure to a certain extent um and i even made the claim in the book that he honored his influences by not writing about them in some way so because he didn't want to be affiliated with any kind of school or any kind of system or any kind of dogma and it's this very anti-systematic kind of approach 
And so you can only make inferences in some way because his writing is just, he strips it of all of this dogma and nomenclature. But there's a spirit there that really connects his work with all of these other traditions, you know. And so his Druidry for me is very much like Sufism in some way. I think it's a very close comparison to a certain extent. And so the way in which the Sufis were people of the world in many respects, and there was the spirituality of everyday life, I think Howe's Druidry was very much the same way. It wasn't something he had to explicitly talk about. But as we said, it was more of the mind of the Druid, the spirit of the Druid, the soul of the Druid that he was interested in. Hmm. Would you say that uh, central to Howe's psychology is uh, um, becoming oneself? Yes. Like to be that, that individual expression of um, creation of Awin, like that that was the... Um, the, the main goal of his therapy? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah, I think 100% that that would be the goal of his therapy is to help people become their own most authentic, truest versions of themselves. And that, of course, requires a tremendous amount of courage. And that is, in some way, it's an articulation or a specific instance of the manner in which the source or Awan is expressing itself. And so there's an oh, there's always a connection with that source. And that's sort of like the kingdom of God within you, waiting for you to find it, right? You know, as Jesus talks about, like, that's where it is. And that's the source of healing. And I would say for how what he was always trying to do was point to that, capital T-H-T, you know, that source of healing in the patient, in himself, in the consulting room, in the world, and again, to move out of its way to a certain extent, and then from time to time, kind of move in such a way so that you maybe ask questions, you make comments, you make articulations to further facilitate it. But again, like, that's that way wu way kind of idea, you know, you're just kind of flowing with it to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of how he applied these ideas in the clinical practice? Like, I think he he talks that um, like dialogue is central or, or what he calls dialectic. I'm not sure of the difference between dialogue and dialectic, but uh, like how would he do help guide people through like an inquiry process? Um, they bring uh, some symptom, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm depressed would he uh, try to help them get into the phenomenon of the experience? Like what's actually happening here and now, like getting, seeing through the label and into the experience or, so was that like a, a kind of guided inquiry process or you have any idea how he worked? Yeah, absolutely. I think when we look at kind of like cure or heal is basically his, for me, his book on psychotherapy, right? You know, that 1965, that's, I mean, he talks about psychotherapy throughout all of his books. But for me, like that's his book on psychotherapy. And if it was the one book that could be reprinted or published, that's for me what it would be. Because you know, it's methodological in a way? In some ways, yeah, it is in some ways. I mean, so like when you think of psychotherapy, you know, like you were talking about the experience of depression, for instance, or melancholy or mourning or whatever it might be, right? So through a process of inquiry, through a process of dialogue, right? And so let's just call it dialogue versus like the dialectic, right? So the idea is to help the patient kind of discover what the being of that experience actually is. You know, what's really happening in this experience of depression and how, and if you, if you remember from the chapter, he says depression is what? It's a part of the cure. Right. And so that's a very radically different approach. So depression is not something to be eliminated or cured, but listened to. So I think what he tried to do through inquiry and through dialogue is help the patient learn to listen to what the experience of depression was telling them, what it was communicating to them, and actually how it was part of the healing process itself which, I mean, nowadays in depth psychological schools, that's a bit more commonplace. Mm 
-hmm. But I think back then, you know, there was something very radical about that. Like, what is this phenomenon of depression saying to me? You know, and in some ways, like once it gets to that point, the voice of the depression has become amplified to such a degree because it may have been ignored. And now all of a sudden, like a nightmare, it's getting your attention and bringing you into the consulting room. And so what is it telling you? How is it like an angel or a messenger, right? How is it communicating something valuable? And how can you help the patient listen to it? And then I think he believed once listened to, there's a way in which it becomes a kind of guide or it becomes a kind of guru, becomes a kind of teacher, right? Like Hillman, who you talked mm -hmm. about before, talks about, you know, um, people come to psychotherapy to figure out why they were in psychotherapy, right? And I think yeah. there's truth to that. And once you figure out why you came to psychotherapy, the therapy's over. <laughs> it's over. I completely agree with that. And I've experienced that, right? Um, but that involves like this careful listening process. You know, what is the, what is my experience of depression telling me? What does it reveal about self? What does it reveal about other? What does it reveal about the world? How does the world show up differently when I'm depressed? What does it attune me to when I'm depressed mm -hmm. versus let's just cure it? And that's understandable because it's painful, right? Just make it go away. But ultimately it's to be attuned to it, to listen to it. And sometimes for how like that process, um, he said, sometimes it's just helpful to keep the patient alive. If you remember, mm -hmm. like to keep them alive through that the, process. The, the therapist's job with someone who's like very <laughs> deeply depressed or suicidal is just to keep them alive. Like keep them alive. Like he says um, in that quote that I read, you know, your responsibility is to like um, bandage the wound or to to set the bones and then let the you know let life take care of the healing. That's right. Let yeah. life take care of the healing. To surrender, because he uses the term surrender quite a lot a throughout his work um, to surrender to the healing process. And I think intellectually, we can understand that, but experientially to let go and to surrender to a process like that is terrifying. It's frightening. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, speaking of Hillman, when he came out with revisioning psychology in the seventies, uh, you know, one of his rules of thumb was uh, based in this concept of pathologizing, uh, of uh, following the symptom. And so when Howe was saying that 10, 20 years earlier, uh, I could see how it was controversial because it was controversial when Hillman put that forward as a rule of thumb of his archetypal psychology. Yes. And um, still, when I repost some things from Hillman, it's still controversial and mm -hmm. maybe more so because I think therapy has gotten more uh, kind of reductive and um, causal, uh, more diagnostic, kind of more kind of constricted mm -hmm. since, you know, since Hillman's passing even, um, you know, to paraphrase Hillman, <laughs> one of my favorite books of his, we've had now 130 years of psychotherapy and the world's gotten well, even worse. Gotten even worse, right? Yeah, I love the title. <laughs> Of that book for sure. But well, we can just yeah. continue to extend that, you know. We just had more psychotherapy and things are getting even worse. Yeah. And um, I really like too, and I think this is somewhat true of how, you know, when Hillman talks about this idea of having a patient like learn to sing their symptoms in some way. And when the patient can sing the symptoms, they cease being symptoms and they become song, it becomes poetic. Mm -hmm. And so how does the patient describe their experience of depression and how does the experience, how does the description of the experience in some way reinforce the pain, the suffering versus something more poetic, which allows you to get into the heart of the phenomenon. You know, like even for how he says the difference between fantasy PH and fantasy with a F, right? He makes a clear distinction is that fantasy with a PH kind of separates you from reality, whereas fantasy with an F allows you to experience it more deeply. And so mm -hmm. the imagination, the imaginal, the archetypes and all of that. 
there are ways in some way to experience a phenomenon more deeply, like of depression even, like to re-narrativize it in some way, to tell its story a little differently. Yeah, yeah, the, the creative act uh, puts you in relationship to whatever it is, the depression, the anxiety, mm -hmm. the fear, um, the disease, it puts you in relationship to it. Whereas the, the diagnosis and the labels keeps you at the distance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this problem of nominalism that Hillman talked about early yes. on. Yeah. So to be in relationships, so sculpt it, dance it, sing it. The idea is to uh, be in creative relationship with it. And that, so you're getting to know it by being a kind of a vehicle for some kind of creative expression of it. Cause you have to, you have to like inquire, like, uh, well, what, what do you, what does this depression feel like? Like when I'm depressed, where am I? Am I in a valley? Am I at the bottom of the sea? Am I alone in space? Uh, so all of a sudden you're personalizing the, uh, the illness or the, the symptom itself. And uh, that, that just changes everything, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It's like, I don't know how it changes, like, you know, what the mechanism is, uh, but it does change your experience of suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that very idea is key for how and for depth psychology in general, right? So there's this way in which, like you said, and that comes from the, from Hillman's tradition, you know, this personalizing kind mm -hmm. of notion, you know, and that's a powerful way of re-narrativizing and mythologizing the experience and really connecting to it through fantasy with the cap with with F, you know, and that's I think what Howe was talking about. Fantasy allows you to deepen your experience of something, and so these examples that you brought up, you know, referencing an archetypal approach, are ways of deepening one's experience of that. But I think for how he wouldn't limit himself to that. Like he would say, that's one way of doing that. But there are also other ways as well. And for each patient, it's going to be a bit different. And I think that's powerful. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the other ways that he had of uh, helping patients work creatively through their suffering? I think oftentimes it was often through a kind of veiled way of teaching meditation. And so like when he talks about his meditation technique that I articulated in the book, I gave everyone what that was. So if you want to use Hal's meditation technique, like there it was ultimately. But I think there's a way in which when he practiced psychotherapy, it was a way of imparting a meditative way of being in the world. So beyond the mythic archetypal imaginal way of experiencing the phenomenon what happens too when you bracket even all of that because he could say that too is a story now it's a wonderful story that one says or tells about the experience but when one brackets even that and connects with the emotion the feeling the phenomenon with that story even being bracketed what happens Mm -hmm. what gets experienced right yeah and, and that itself can can turn into a trap which i've seen uh i find it especially prevalent in people who are really into um internal family systems oh yeah yeah it's like I now know. they have this whole new way of relating to all these like inner voices and impulses and everything but itself can become a really constraining story um yeah, so it becomes its own kind of trap. So I really appreciate Howe's addition of uh, the other way of um, becoming larger than, or uh, it's it's hard to talk about without sounding like grandiose or something, because it's not about transcendence. I think it's about something like becoming larger, becoming larger than the little me and its stories, uh, right. whether they're negative stories or stories that make us feel better. Um, but also creating space for that which is larger and greater than. And that's something that Hillman never really could get into. Like he was so allergic to any kind of spiritual ideas. And 
you know, he spoke for soul so adamantly because no one else was really speaking for soul. And so I think that was his role. Uh, but for myself, having had, you know, a very long relationship with yoga and plant medicines and these kind of things, I have to have a space for the self, which is greater than any of that. And for me, that's the place of, of relief, actually, if I can um, stay connected to that, everything else diminishes in importance and affect. Uh, and so I think how has that in his psychology? Spot on, I think spot on. And that's that which is beyond sort of the imaginal or the mythic or the archetypal, right? It's whatever story that one tells to oneself or whatever story that has been told to oneself that which you are, that which who you are, is greater than that. And so there's this idea that the vastness of the self can hold multiple stories, and those stories can be conflicting, they can be conflictual, and one doesn't have to identify with either one. One can just see them, to note them, observe them, and say, yeah, I'm basically this mansion with many rooms, but I'm not any one room. My mansion, myself, can hold all of these stories, but I don't have to be identified with any one of them. So it's not to disidentify and say, well, that's not me, but it's to say, this isn't only me. Like, I'm more than this, and I can hold this. And, you know, in ACT, it's kind of like ACT therapy. It's kind of like psychological flexibility, you know? Yeah. Like, that's that for me, that's an important concept in some way. It's like, how can I tolerate ambivalence? How can I tolerate mutually conflicting stories about the self? And I think Howe was a big proponent of that. He used different language, of course. But I think that's kind of a big part of the psychotherapy, too. How can you honor these aspects of the self that you want to disavow? How can you hold them in some way? How are they also are important? They also are telling. They also are you. But not you're not limited to those stories. Yeah. Kind of like what Jung said so succinctly that uh, it's not so much as we cure our problems as we outgrow them. We outgrow them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think um, this is in alignment with, with Howe's approach. You know, when I hear people talk about uh, killing the ego through <laughs> meditation or, or working with psychedelics or whatever, um, they're getting, they're getting it all wrong. Uh, the ego itself is not bad. It's usually just um, kind of immature and um, uneducated <laughs> in a way. And so I think the goal, and I think how also believe this, is that um, we've got to put the ego in, in a right relationship to something that is greater than the ego. Uh, and then the ego then has a job to do. It has something greater than itself to serve. Yes. And, and then it's no longer a problem because it's kind of putting the ego in its right place. And yeah. Yeah. And I think he would say right relationship when the ego is in its right place and it's, it's in a as, right place. As servant to experiencer of all of that, right? All of that. Right. It's kind of right diminished, uh, diminished uh, position. Yes. Yeah. It's not deified in some way. It's put in its proper role in relationship to that, in relationship to the mysterious other, to the source, to Awen. And then, like for how it was, he talked about having a right attitude to life. You know, it's really about how one kind of orients themselves toward the world and to a way of living. You know, these technologies of the self, how does one live? How does one exist in the world with self and others? Right. That's ultimately where it's at. And um, on a deeper level, it's about, as you said, the ego in right relationship to that which is greater than it, not to kill it off, not to murder it, not even to say it's an illusion, but what's its right relationship? Well, having had this experience of... Uh... You know, for the, me, the way I contextualize it was um, Christ consciousness. Um, the, the, the biggest problem is like knowing how that 
allows for a completely different relationship to other people and the challenges of life. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you introduce somebody to that? And and that's been the challenge of spiritual teachers all through the ages. Like, how do I impart this to people? Because I see so many people undergoing like such unnecessary suffering. Like there, to me, I put two categories of suffering out there. Like there's suffering that's unavoidable. It's like life is going to bring you plenty of suffering to deal with. And then there's a whole nother category of suffering that is avoidable. It's suffering that we create for ourselves due to not being in right relationship mm-hmm. to that, right? Ego kind of running the show. But how do you introduce that greater self to people? Um, how do you introduce people to that greater self? It's always the biggest challenge. Um, yeah, it certainly is. Um, and I think when I think about that, it's about learning the art of suffering to a certain degree, right? Because part of letting that or the source or awen do its work in this way in which you're not interfering with it is also helping one form a right relationship with suffering. People don't know how to suffer, right? They think that connecting to the source is all about a more elevated kind of spiritual state that might bypass painful experience, where I think part of that process is experiencing in some way emotions that had been avoided at one time. Right. So there's a way in which the re experiencing of powerful emotions is a prerequisite toward attaining any kind of enlightened state, you know, because otherwise it's a form of bypassing. And so I think part of that is helping people learn how to suffer in a way that, in some ways, can be cleansing, can be transformative, and to surrender to it to a certain extent. And I think that part of it you know, was a big part of Hal's work. And you could see where, like, the influence of, like, the real essence of Christianity was there, you know, like, there's this what there's this way in which um, one's woundedness and one's relationship to one's wounds can be transformative, and one can be crucified, if you will, but have a resurrected body, but the wounds are still there, right? I always thought that that was telling that in the resurrected body, the wounds were still present. And I thought for myself, what a beautiful image of enlightenment or illumination or rebirth that is, because it could have appeared in whatever way it wanted to, but it appears in a resurrected form with the wounds still present. So I think that's important. Yeah, like with the Doubting Thomas story, it's like the the proof of life is in the wound. In the wound. How's that for a t-shirt? Isn't that a great t-shirt idea? The proof of life. I even like the the saying, the proof of life is in the womb. <laughs> mm-hmm. That just came to me. That must, like you know, it. that's the third speaking through. Um, yeah, I remember years ago when I happened upon Philip Cargom's little book, uh, I think it's called The Way of the Druid or The Druid's Way. Uh-huh. I was uh, deep in my kind of first period of my yogic studies and I read it and I said, he's describing yoga here to be in a kind of a joyful participatory relationship with the world. I say, I was going to say the natural world and I corrected myself and said, no, just the world. world. Right. And um, that's the sense I get from how as well as what he's describing in a, uh, kind of attitude that he's promoting is uh the result of a yoga um the the mind of the druid to me is the mind of the yogi or the mind of the the taoist master you know um and it's wonderful and i wonder (laughs) if it's not time uh you know a time where people would be more open to that and actually like kind of wanting more of that attitude in their psychology. Cause I think it would be certainly be helpful. (laughs) For sure. Yeah, (laughs) I do too. Um, You know, and I think, 
those that have had a taste of what you're talking about, when they're living this life infused with joy, which isn't separate from suffering in any way, it's not a life that's free from that, but in many ways, a life that comes from that. If other people see that, then they become curious. What's this about? Like, mm -hmm. where did you pick up on this? Where did your worldview come from, right? So it invites curiosity and invites questioning, you know, in terms of the way in which we comport ourselves in a joyful manner. So others become curious about it. And it's a way in some way of preaching the gospel without words. It's mm -hmm. living. Without proselytizing, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. so to put people, and I think what Howe would do in psychotherapy is to put people in a position where they could experience that mysterious other and help them see what is already there, not just in the consulting room, but outside of the consulting room. Because there's a way in which, and it's absolutely true for me, the mysterious other, the source is ever present. It's not something that you like have to dig too much for. It's yeah. there in everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, this experience I, I referred to of Christ consciousness, is, it's just how I understood it it's because of my background and everything else. It's the words I had following the experience, but the experience itself, there was no label on it. What the experience was, was the experience of radical acceptance of everything. And, and it followed a really, uh, a deep cleaning process process um so a kind of kenosis you know i was able to kind of figure that out later oh first the emptying out then the radical acceptance of everything and oh that's love and <laughs> that's the antidote to all of the conflict that we're seeing in in people in relationships between nations oh if we could only get there and so that blissful joy of the experience was immediately followed by a crashing down of grief, like how unnecessary so much of this suffering is. It's like the blessing and the curse of that kind of experience. Um, and that kind of experience sets a pretty damn high watermark. So there was no danger of me becoming inflated and thinking that I was uh, walking around with Christ consciousness all the time. It let me know just how kind of how much of a failure I am at living up to that most of the time. So there was like a built-in uh, humiliating effect <laughs> as well, which I thought was pretty wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, isn't that intelligent? Just to make sure I don't get too full of myself and think um the second coming. Yeah. Uh, you know? And absolutely. And I think if we talk more about love just for a bit, there's a way in which... You know, how psychotherapy and how metaphysics is a metaphysics of love, you know, because we can talk about the mysterious other, you know, we can talk about Awin, we can talk about that, but there's a way in which it has to become enfleshed, right? This idea has to take form, it has to be incarnational, it has to be relational in some way. And so, like, when I hear your experience, you know, I feel it in the body, you know, I don't feel it in this nebulous cerebral region. I feel it in the body. I feel it in the soul. I feel more connected to the earth. I feel connected to the flesh. Mm -hmm. in ways. And so how's psychotherapy and spirituality, if you will, was a very embodied one. It was one in which, you know, there wasn't this tendency towards schizoid withdrawal or separation you know, even idealizing the true self, right? Because yeah, or idealizing the witness and always be in the witness. Yes, that. we always yeah. have to be there and all of that, right? There's a way in which there's an underlying schizoid component to that. And that's where one has to be careful because, yeah, witness consciousness, Christ consciousness, Buddha nature, all of that, right? There's this tendency, if you listen to a person's description, that it can be very disembodied detached disconnected schizoid separate and then one indulges in how his words on fantasy one feeds off of it 
and then creates a false self system where false and true are actually inverted in a way. <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. Right. Like, yeah, I see that most often um, in, well, both the kind of the spiritual community, you know, the yogic meditative world and also the psychedelic world when people get, have an experience of uh, what they describe as non-duality um, of the ineffable. That's a catchphrase that people love to use. Well, it's like, but you're talking about it all the time. How right. ineffable is it really? <laughs> <laughs> and if it really was a non-dual experience, then who is there having the experience? Right. You know. So when when pressed, it kind of all falls apart, but people get really enamored with that and start to identify with it. And sooner or later, their health goes to shit. Their relationships go to shit. I see it happen all the time. All the time. Yeah. And again, if we return to the idea of the giant, you know, head in the clouds, right. feet on the ground, but the body, a robust feeling body in between, right? That becomes a powerful image. And you could even use that as a diagnostic marker in some way, like, you know, if I'm identifying with the ineffable, is there a way in which I'm ignoring the big body, you know, the feeling body that is in between my feet on the earth and my head in the clouds? And so I, I always think of that, that image sometimes in terms of like, yeah, it's a very powerful image of wholeness in some way. And I want to make sure the body is a feeling body, you know, a body that feels and responds to life in all of its aspects. Mm -hmm. yeah here <laughs> bringing back the giant i had the image of uh is a decapitated head full of hot air floating up into space yeah <laughs> yeah floating up in space leaving like the feet and the body on the earth yeah. all on the earth yeah that's a great image <laughs> um hmm. i'm just going to take a look at my notes make sure i'm not forgetting anything crucial that i wanted to ask you about Well, I think, you know, we've got a good kind of uh, overview of, of how and placing him in in psychology as a field, um, getting a sense of some of his uh, ideas and approach. Uh, how do I find this book, The Mind of the Druid? Because that's the one I, I feel like I'm most intrigued by. But, I, you know, even through my various ways of finding things on the, the hidden internet. I still haven't been able to track down a copy. So how did you find these books? So when I was doing my dissertation um, back, like in the early 2000s, um, I had the same problem. They were all out of print with the exception of one book at the time. And that was his book called War Dance. That was the only one that was in print. And I remember I got it from barnesandnoble.com. And I think it may have been like the last copy that was left, to be honest, because <laughs> nobody's searching for books by E. Graham Howell. Is it so, one of those books that when you get it in the mail, like the uh, the edges are all kind of yellowed and you can tell <laughs> this book has been in the remainder bin for like 10 years? No, this one, I'm, look, I'm looking at it right now. Like it, it was actually in really good condition. Hmm. You know, it was in, like no one touched it. It was probably just sitting there for a while. Um, but the rest of his books... I had to find from vendors, many of which were overseas, like in used bookstores. Right. Um, many of them go back to the 1940s, the 1930s, and they're old, broken down books. Some of them with the bindings completely split. Um, his, so, his books, correct me if I'm wrong, but they weren't distributed outside of the UK, were they? And right. so if we're going to find used copies, they're probably uh, in old bookstores in the UK. Yep. So you could yeah. go to um, ABE, Advanced Book Exchange. You can just type in um, his name and see what comes up. Some of the copies are really expensive, as you can. And the imagine. shipping would be killer to North America. It would be killer. Yeah. So incidentally, to your point, though, so I've talked with Anathema Publishing about yeah. possibly reprinting many of his books because you and others are like, well, how can, because people have read the anthology, Druid of Harley Street, people have read that, but they want like the whole book. Yeah. So 
like I'm we're we're actually exploring the possibility of having some of his books reprinted. Um yeah. and it's it's a matter of tracking down in England who owns the publishing rights. And so I actually have a contact um of a relative of his um that may be the owner of the publishing rights. So we're gonna explore that and find out. So sure. perhaps soon you'll see reissued editions of some of his books. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. um, and Ian, you're writing other books too. There's this whole, like there's two sides to how I thought, you know, when I'm, when I'm getting into his work and I read, you know, he, at one step he's talking about these kind of complex metaphysics, like trying to describe the un, undescribable of that. Uh, and then these kind of very practical humanistic uh, approaches to psychotherapy, where he's giving you a list of like the qualities of a good therapist and like really kind of uh, practical down to earth advice from a seasoned psychotherapist. I got the sense like there are there are two hows like like Jung's number one and number two personality, right. the hidden one and the public persona and um, the kind of the mystic and then the practical uh, philosopher, that kind of thing. I get the sense that you also have, well, probably more than two sides, but you've also got this deep interest in the esoteric and the yes. occult. Uh, I mean, and you work um, at a at a university. You work at Duquesne, is that right? That's correct. And you run like a student wellness center, something like that. Is that is right, Center for Student Wellbeing. Mm -hmm. Well, ha what do they think of having this uh, this closeted or not closeted <laughs> occultist in their midst? Well, here's the thing with that: like, <laughs> they're like, okay, everybody... just keep the <laughs> keep the Crowley out of uh, that's out right. of the office. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, not everybody knows about it. For one, there are some that know about it. Um, but not everybody at Duquesne knows about it. But I would say, um, yeah, I do have an interest in the occult and esoteric philosophy, but I am approaching it from a different angle, right? I'm trying to approach it as a psychologist and I'm trying to approach it as a philosopher, right? And I'm looking at, you know, major contemporary occult texts like the Book of the Law, the Book of Pleasure, um, some of Kenneth Grant's work, but trying to situate it on different philosophical foundations, so reading it through a different lens. Um, so some of my work in that area has been called like grammatology, so it's kind of like an occult grammatology, so imagine like Derrida in some way meeting the occult that's kind of what you get. I dialogue a lot of Heidegger, um, Merleau Ponty, um, with occult text, Jacques Lacan. Um, so I'm doing different things with it. So it's not like your typical commentaries on the occult, um, where I'm not simply uh, repeating, you know, traditional ways of understanding esoteric texts. Um, I'm trying to get into a little bit of trouble in some way with both the occult world, but also <laughs> the academic world. So I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I don't really fit into either camp, and that's okay. Um, there are a lot of other people that have similar interests, and um, you know, I think the work has been very well received, incidentally. Um, and the beautiful thing about... Um, the occult world, if you will, or people in the occult is that they're very accepting of different approaches, many of them. Yeah, yeah you know? not, there are the fundamentalists. Though, there are, there are some every as school. Well. Not every school, right. And so I've been critical of those too, like as a dis dis disguised version of uh, fundamentalist Christianity where they're just changing the names of the gods. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the reasons why I sought to look at it from a more ontological point of view and in some ways to deconstruct it because a lot of what I've read um, about occult philosophy is kind of situated on a very, in some way, um, I don't wanna say a monotheistic kind of ground, um, but a worldview that very much reminds me of Christianity. And they're just, again, using different names. So for me, what does it look like when it's situated on a different ontological ground, you know? So 
I dialogue this stuff with a lot of different philosophers, post-structuralists, um, just to give it a different feel. And then to see what it looks like after I put it through that filter, I've seen it through that lens. Hmm. Is part of it to kind of test and see what'll um, stand up to uh, that kind of filtering process? Like, is there any gold left after the filtering? I have an image of a sieve and, you know, is there, is there anything worth saving here? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a way in which that's a very good point. Like, you know, if you think about, um, you know, Nietzsche talks about the, the twilight of the idols and the subtitle is how does, how one philosophizes with a hammer. And so <laughs> it's not like a sledgehammer that one uses, but a tuning hammer. Right. Uh, and so yeah. one taps on an idol, on a phenomenon. And obviously, the more hollow it is, the more liable it is to crack when you just tap it. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which what you're saying is somewhat true. It's like, and there is a lot of gold in esoteric and occult literature. I mean, a tremendous amount of gold. And I think using a different angle and looking at it through these different philosophical kinds of lenses. For me, I'm I'm drawing what I believe is a lot of gold from that and then representing it in some way in book form. Hmm. Uh, I can certainly see why uh, you connected with um, Stanton Marlin, who has also been on the podcast and who, when I read him, I have, I have a real hard time with it because I don't have a philosophy background. And he goes really deep into philosophy and he's got such a kind of depth of knowledge there that I get a bit lost. Um, so I, I can tell, you know, that you guys are probably uh, of the same ilk. Yeah, he was my clinical supervisor, actually, for a while. Oh, here okay. And he wrote one of the forewords to the book on how. Well, yeah, about... that's where I saw the connection, but uh, yeah. I didn't realize he was actually your supervisor. So did you choose him as a supervisor because he saw a lot of resonance there? Yeah, you could say that, that I chose him. Um, you know, we can talk about what that means ultimately, you know, to choose. Well, I just, I don't know how it works. Uh, no, no, I, I did. I did. You get uh, assigned your supervisor. Do you choose? Yeah, it was, he was someone that I chose um, in my third year because you had to have an external supervisor and knowing a little bit about his background very much resonated with me and um, very much connected with him throughout that process and um i even gosh what was it maybe a month ago had lunch with him you know so we convened for lunch and just had a great conversation and um you know he's someone who's very much influenced my approach to things my way of kind of taking up psychotherapy taking up the esoteric subjects um and so i draw a lot of gold from his work for sure mm -hmm. So the um, the books that you've written on, uh, well, Being and Non-Being in Occult Experience, Volume 1, The Book of the Law, and then another volume on the Chiasmata of Austin Osman Spare. Uh, would you say that uh, people need a, a kind of a, a deep philosophical grounding in order to understand those books? <laughs> um there's a third one that just came out too on Kenneth Grant and the Vulture's Cry. So that just came out um, this past year. Um, and so I'm working on a fourth volume of that, which should be published probably during the summer of this year. And um, then there's a collaborative volume called The Torn Letters of Otherness um, with Peter Hamilton Giles of uh, Atramentus Press, who's one of my publishers um, and just a phenomenal mind um, someone who can you know nicely integrate um, esoteric occult philosophy with existential phenomenology and uh, I wish more people would read his work because I think he and his work is a real gem um, but I would say like here's the thing so people have said these works are very complex obviously to read and you know they use kind of nomenclature that can be very challenging but it's more of a reading that kind of in some way challenges your ability to try to understand it. It's more of an evocational, invocational kind of reading where one reads and has an experience. And so when people read it and say, well, I don't have, I have a hard time understanding it. I often say, mm -hmm. well, what comes up for you as you read it? 
Right. And so when that question gets asked, then different things come up for different people. And what comes up for them is actually quite amazing to hear. Right. So that's part of it. Right. Like there's not one thing to get from it. It's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And what'd you say? Encantory or it's invocational, evocational, invocational, yeah. Participatory. Yeah. yeah. Meant to kind of stir things up. Yes. <laughs> and then see what floats to the top see for what you. Floats to the top. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you spending this time with me, um, helping me and people listening uh, get a glimpse into the life of E. Graham Howe. And now this book that I have uh, with, you know, the gold debossing and beautiful illustrations and the signed book plate and all that, this is a, a limited edition. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, something more like a trade hardback or paperback that's going to be coming out of this work? That's a great question. Um, and I will say, I don't know. I don't know if there will be a trade paperback edition, um, but your question is prompting me to ask the publisher if that's the case. Um, and certainly it's something that I think we can explore, but yeah, I don't know right now um, if there will be a paperback edition, but it's a great question. And okay. um, I actually meet with him on Thursday of this week. So it's something I could ask. Yeah. Great, because it would definitely help to get uh, uh, E. Graham House work out there more, mm -hmm. um, for sure, especially because it's just kind of so beautifully intriguing. I'm sure a lot of people, even the title, I drew it in psychologist clothing, like like it perked up my ears. I was like, for sure, that's curious. I want to know I mean, about this guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, best of luck with everything, and um, we'll uh, include links to your website, down below and to anathema publishing where they can hopefully still buy some of these limited edition copies if they're interested um and maybe we'll see it down the road i really appreciate your time for sure thank you very much brian and yeah i had a great time and i enjoyed the dialogue great thanks so much ian take care right. hey bye-bye bye-bye